A mission to Mars, I guess you can get to Mars. Yeah. And this is the problem that you had with Apollo too, is you can get people to the moon. Getting them back is always an issue. I mean, is that one of the real stumbling blocks with Mars? I mean, what would a Mars mission look like, do you think? Well, um, if you've seen the movie The Martian, that has a lot of the ingredients in it, actually. I mean, it was a really excellent movie. I mean, actually, I, re I really loved it. Uh, mostly because of the human ingenuity and survival, okay, because that's, you have to have that <laughs> if you're going to be going to another planet. Um, so part of the problem is uh, it's not so easy to, when you're in orbit around the Earth and the Moon, you can in fact, uh, on the Moon, in orbit around the Moon and on the Moon, you can get back almost any time. Uh, that's not true with Mars because you have to have uh, the uh, positions of the planets in certain configurations. So. Um, you know, uh, there are times when you really can't get back to uh, the Earth in a short period of time. It would take a long, long time to get back. So these are kind of launch windows. We can go between here and here, and it'll take us X months to get there. Uh, and once you get there, then uh, you can come back on that same launch window, um, or you can wait for the next one, which is like uh, a few hundred days later. When the Viking mission occurred, the first landing on the surface of Mars, I was sitting next with Carl Sagan uh, when the first color image came down. And these were the days when it came down a line at a time. And the two of us were sitting there waiting for this first image. And, and, and I'm watching the lines come down. I said, Carl, Carl, look at this. Look at this rock. It's got holes in it. This could be, and, and, you know, I'm a geologist. Okay, I was really excited by this. And, and Carl leans back in his chair. He says, Jim, we've just confirmed one of the findings of Paleolithic man. Mars is red. And I go, wow. <laughs> that's cosmic. And here I am looking at the rock for crying out loud. That's the kind of visionary you need, somebody who's thinking way ahead. We've talked about Elon Musk, we've talked about uh, China, the U.S., but there are other countries uh, diving in, Israel, India. Talk to me about what you see out there. I think the moon is the testing ground for pride and prestige, essentially soft power, demonstrations of capabilities. So, for example, uh, Israel is going to launch uh, a mission uh, to the moon in a couple of weeks, okay, on a Falcon rocket. And I'm helping work with them on the, the technology, uh, the landing site. Okay, where do we want to land on the moon? So uh, in a couple of weeks, my wife and I are going to go down and watch the launch. It's going to be amazing. And that spacecraft is put together by a group of people in Israel that funded it, and a bunch of engineers got together. Uh, the um, Google X Prize is another one. They're all kinds of people coming to the fore. Uh, we have capabilities now with the commercial lunar provider program that NASA has put together to have a lot of companies put together the capability to go to the moon and deliver small payloads. So now students can design things that might actually be performed and go to the moon in their graduate career, for example. So this, this is both from a country point of view and a technology point of view and a commercial point of view, it's a, it's a new ball game. It's very, very exciting. If you haven't yet discovered, James Head is very excited about space exploration. In fact, he's used the word incredible 12 times so far. I asked him what excites him about the current space landscape. Well, every day I'm excited because we're always learning new things. And we have a spacecraft in orbit around the moon, around Mars, and, you know, just finished one on Mercury and so on. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, but I think the, there are two things. Uh, one of them is exoplanets. So we're discovering new planets around other stars every day. And people who, astronomers who study these and discover these, now come to me and say, what do we know about Venus that can help us understand these 50 Venus-like planets we're, under, we're discovering? I go, oh my God, there's a menagerie out there. There's a, there's a, a kind of like a population of Venus-like planets. I never thought I would be able to see another Venus, but they're all out there. So that's a big deal. So we're now taking the knowledge we have from our exploration and our continuing exploration, and then applying that to understanding these multiple thousands of solar systems out there and these many thousands of planets. So that's very exciting. The second thing is, I think, you know, uh, the commercialization of space in the broadest sense. Of course, you know, commercial entities have built the lunar module, companies, but now we have entrepreneurs and um, the ability to get to the moon rel relatively rapidly and with small payloads, et cetera. So Elon Musk, uh, you know, the idea of going to Mars, you know, he's building this huge rocket, which in fact is capable of taking lots of humans to the surface of Mars. And this is like, oh my God, the man is serious. 
I went to the, I, I do some consulting with, with SpaceX, and being on the floor of their facility at Hawthorne, California, the energy and the dynamic aspect of that is just like Apollo. These people are on a mission. They're on a mission, and they're going to put all that together. And by the way, we're launching in 2024. Okay, we're going. There's a vision here. I mean, visionaries like John Kennedy, you know, Carl Sagan, uh, you know, Elon Musk. These are the kind of things that are propelling us, and they're really working the system so that they can actually get the capability to do this. Vision's important, but a space race between the Soviets and the United States was also important. I mean, do we see a, a space race now? Is that, is that a good thing? That's true. The, the, you know, we did not go to the moon with humans and do all this geology, et cetera, for science. We went there for national pride and prestige. Uh, it was definitely a competition with the Soviet Union. Uh, will that emerge with China? I, I don't know. I actually don't know. I don't know today, I think, what would motivate us into a national program of that magnitude. Uh, uh, my personal view would be that I would like to see, uh, you know, continuing exploration by different countries of the solar system and collaboration where possible. I don't, I don't know whether there would be one of those aha moments where we have to motivate and mobilize the whole country to respond. We are going to the moon. The U.S. is going back to the moon. Uh, there are plans to send humans to the surface of the moon. Presidential directive number one is look, we're going back to the moon and on to Mars. So um, I don't, I don't see, uh, I don't see a major event in my mind, at least, that would propel us into a neck-to-neck um, -neck competition like we had with the Soviets. I think that that was a special time. What do you think? Is that likely? You know, I think. I don't know the answer to that, and I'm, I'm anxious to be witness to the outcome, I think. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, soft power is really important, and I think China is doing a really good job of, of, um, of utilizing that. The far side of the moon, uh, some of the takeaways from there, uh, what do you see as the most important? Chang'e 4 is a pioneer in the exploration of uh, the, the lunar far side, so it's going, it's where did it land? Exactly where we wanted it to land, like in the middle of this huge basin, in the middle of a crater, Von Karman, which is another hole in the big hole. So it's going to optimize access to this deep material. And so it's, it's really the pioneering. I think the other very important point about the far side is that uh, Magpie Bridge, uh, the, the communication satellite, is really opening up the moon with infrastructure. I've argued for years that what we need is a communication set of satellites in lunar orbit, which we could then enable other nations to share so that they could explore the far side, etc. But NASA has so many things on their plate. Great things, okay. Imagine, you know, flying past Pluto for crying out loud. What's out there? That's great. But um, I think the Chinese recognize the strategic part of that in terms of the exploration of, of, the, of the far side of the moon. And so that communication satellite is a real piece of infrastructure to explore the future of the moon. The Chinese are also thinking in the way long term, so they have an instrument on board that is exploring uh, the radio space, so to speak, on the far side, to think about putting astronomy observatories, literally observatories on the far side of the moon where it's very radio quiet. So that's really a, a, a remarkable piece of forward thinking and forward planning as well. Because blocking out that sound, it, it, you enter an entirely different dimension, don't you? I mean, you do, it, it, you it, do. I know your, your, your thrust is rocks, but for somebody who's on, into that, it's, it's mind-blowing. Oh, oh it? absolutely. It's just, you know, it's, it reminds me of the story when Dave Scott, the commander of the Apollo 15 mission, got back uh, to Earth. You know, when the astronauts would come back, we'd always sit around and talk a lot. Like, what was it like? What's going on? Debriefing, we call it. It's just great fun. So Dave told me, that, you know, Jim, you've really got to appreciate being in lunar orbit, the three sides of the moon. He said, okay, so you go around and um, essentially you're on the sunlit side and then you start seeing longer and longer shadows and you pass the line between night and day. It's called a terminator. You go past that and it's lights out in a way, but then you really quickly realize that as your eyes become acclimated that you can actually see the surface even though it's night. And what is that? That's Earth light. You look down and you see the surface of the moon from light reflected, sunlight reflected off the Earth onto the moon. It's Earth light. So you're in Earth light, and then all of a sudden, 
that light goes out. And what do you see? You see a place where there are no stars. You don't see the sun, you don't see the earth, you have no communications, you just see a black hole where there are no stars. And as Dave says, that's when you know you're really out there. You're confident you're in lunar orbit, but you have no way of knowing that because there's only a black hole and nothing else. So that's how quiet it is on the far side of the moon. Think about looking outward from that, you know, being on the surface. Growing plants on the moon, China has done this. Uh, talk to me about the importance of that. Well, I think there, again, you know, this is not just a stunt. This is clearly something where people are thinking ahead. And, you know, the question is, you know, what do you do um, when you're on the moon? You know, there's a lot of debate about um, what a lunar base would look like and, you know, how you would sustain life there, et cetera. And so this is part of it. You know, I think, uh, you know, uh, the astronauts in the space station now and Skylab and other things, they, they grew things to see how they would grow in space. And this is yet, yet another experiment to see how things respond. You know, it's a first step. It's not, it's not like a, there's a whole garden there. But again, what, what, what are the pressures, the radio, you know, the temperature swings, uh, radiation, traveling through space, what are the things that are going to affect our ability to grow and live in other areas? So that's, that's a first step. Being able to grow plants in space would certainly be a game changer, and James certainly seems optimistic. But what worries him? What keeps him up at night? Things, things like, you know, how did, uh, you know, if you were on the Earth at the time one of these big impacts hit the moon, what would it look like? What's a side view look like? Uh, you know, where is uh, the water on Mars? Uh, what's in the interior of Mars? Uh, how does the interior of the moon look? Could we figure out the overall evolution of our own planet, Earth? You know, the vast majority of Earth history is erased because of um, all the, you know, the dynamic environment, the weathering, and a lot of it is subducted and pushed under the surface. So the Earth is old, four and a half billion years, but really young from the point of view of its surface. So we're missing the formative years. It's like if I wanted to, um, if I read a book of the history of the Earth, you know, the first 18 out of 20 chapters is gone. <laughs> and so how do we find out what happened then? And fortunately, you look up at the moon and we find out, in fact, that uh, there's your answer. It's preserved, there's no weathering, because there's no water, there's no plate tectonics. And so whatever happened in those formative years is still preserved on the moon. And it's an incredible story. You know, we found out that, geez, on the moon, <laughs> where did it come from? We now know from lunar exploration that uh, impact of a Mars-sized object, one half the diameter of the Earth, hit the Earth in its formative years, the ejecta from that went into orbit around the Earth and formed the moon. So we're, we're, we're like siblings, okay, or progeny, uh, and yet, you know, who would have thought that? And the record of what happened in the early history, the big bombardment coming in, et cetera, is all recorded on the moon. It's just like, so this keeps me up at night. <laughs> Hopefully James' thoughts don't keep him up at night too often, because his day and his thoughts begin long before sunrise. We've talked a lot about deep space, uh, but you also have some thoughts about deep thought uh, and, and how you go about it. Talk to us about your day and how it's structured. Well, I, I like to get up early, um, you know, usually so 3.30 or 4.30 or something like that, and, um, and, and come into work. And, uh, and the reason is because I like to have quiet time. So, um, you know, completely uninterrupted focus time. Uh, I really enjoy interacting with my students, but there's a high overhead on answering a phone call, answering an email, or talking with someone because essentially you're taken away from your deep thought, and that's fine, you know. But so years ago I realized that I needed to partition those two things. So getting up early uh, means that I can come in, and by the time 9 o'clock rolls around, I've had three or four hours of really productive thought. I get to daydream, try to make connections that I wouldn't make otherwise, think deeply about a scientific problem, and it's extremely productive. So by the time other people roll in and the social interactions begin, uh, I'm ready for that. That's fine. You know, it's absolutely part of my job, and I enjoy that. But doing both together is really hard. People say, how, do you, how, how can you work those hours? I love it. Okay? It's great. It's discovery. It's interacting with students who want to go to planets. You know what I mean? How could you, how could you, how could you sleep through that for crying out loud? I think that's, uh, you know, approaching it from a systems point of view, 
and also being able to think about it deeply are, are really important for making advances. So uh, I'd like to think that that's when I do my most creative thing. Daydreaming, you know, it's not, it's not, when I was a kid, daydreaming it was like, kind of like something, get to work, stop daydreaming, you know what I mean? No, 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 you really want to daydream, you really want to daydream. That's when you let the brain make the connections, you know. It's no mistake that people say, I got this great idea when I was in the shower this morning. Well, why, what? You know, did the bar of soap inspire you? No, no, it's the fact that you're doing something that you do every day, it frees your mind, and you start making connections. And, you know, that's just let the brain do its thing. That's daydreaming. And, you know, that's, that's gold. That's gold. Possibly platinum. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate it.